gain from all of this? Yeah, I mean, that is the good thing. It's like we're taking advantage of this whole online life, which, you know, I have been wanting to do this whole series of things online before, and I just kept putting them off because my in-person life was so, you know, busy. Yeah. And no, so now I mean, all I've been focusing on is this. So it's been working out. Perfect. So hi, everyone. We're going to get started um, in about five minutes after. Charles is already on the phone, I mean, on the call. So, like, if you want to just say hi to him really quickly, that's hi, fine. Everyone. I'm trying to get my um, social media life set up so I can Zoom, so I can <laughs> do a live Zoom. Sorry, I'm just also going to grab a bit more water and then I'll be back and we can get, get going. Okay, perfect. Oh, are you joining again, Charles? Oh, no, I think no, no, that's... No, 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 I'm not joining again. Maybe it's no, Daniel that's, that's just coming Daniel. in from Berlin. <laughs> I think that's Daniel <laughs> perpetrating as you, that's all. <laughs> oh, there we go. Hi, Daniel. Uh-oh, let me unmute you, sorry. Just one second. Too many Charles over here. <laughs> I know, I get confused. Okay, hi, Daniel, welcome. Hi, Tony. How are you? About five after. So we're just waiting for a couple more people to join and we'll start the call in about one minute, you guys. Not a problem. Oh, hey, you over there in, uh, all the way in Paul? <laughs> Franjuk. It's all good. It's perfect. Hey, yeah, you got a haircut, Charles. Wow. Yeah, oh, mate. <laughs> oh, mate. Okay. I had to, after you, after you told me four times it's looking bad, I, I just went for it. <laughs> That's good. Let me let me just put the bottle into the picture. Let me try this one more time. Sometimes it wants to work, and sometimes it's just like. Eh. Ronnie, you say also sometimes uh, you've got members that. Logging from, from America and everywhere. I do, from America and from France. Um, and then we have some songs that are in New Zealand. So yeah, people from all okay. over. Okay, wow. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it's been pretty fun. All right, so it's five after. Um, I'm expecting more people to join, but we'll get started right now. Let's go for it. Let's go for it. Welcome, Charles. Welcome to our Black Study Group. I'm so excited to have you. So we have Charles Williams, and we also have Daniel Mueller, who are um, the seller master for DeTorrent and then the owner for DeTorrent. So it's a very, very special, special day here. Um, and I'm super excited. DeTorrent, of course, is close to my heart. I consider you guys family because I worked harvest at DeTorrent once. And I tell you, it was definitely a family environment. And I, I'm a big fan of your wine, and I'm a big fan of your team. So, Charles, why don't you start off by telling us how COVID is treating you, and then just let us know about the tour and tell us what you do as the seller master. Yes, sure. Okay, cool. So, um, Duranit, first of all, thank you very much for, for enjoy, uh, inviting us to join the initiative. Um, from the first time I met you, um, uh, it, it's you're always such a bundle of joy, almost, I want to say. So, it's... It's really nice doing stuff with you. And um, also I think the Black Initiative is it's really cool and it's, it's very good for us to be involved with it. So first of all, thanks for, for letting us join. So myself, I'm the seller master here at Turin. Um, uh, the other Charles Williams on your screen, that's actually Daniel Mueller. So he's the CEO of the company. Um, so if you've got any questions, I think it's a, it's a really nice opportunity if you've got questions that would maybe be 
slightly better answer from a shareholding perspective. Um, I think that's a great opportunity to, for you guys uh, today. So basically, sell a master, big word for, I don't know exactly what you do. I can tell you what, what my little part is. And I've got probably one of the best jobs in the world. It's where you can sit and look at everything holistically. So you basically follow everything from the soil, from the microbes in the soil, how it's going to translate to the vines, how the environment is interacting with the, with the vines, how it's eventually going to start maturing in the grapes when you pick it all the way through the winemaking process, um, decisions on, on long-term aging, how you're going to go about bottling it um, until it reaches the, the final consumer um, or even you guys that's, that's in the, the trade. So the, I'm in the very fortunate position of being the guy that help pivoting all of this different actions and, and put it from the soil into your glass um, where it can be enjoyed by the customer. Can you give us a virtual tour of the Torrin cellar? Just because I feel like it's such a special place. It's not a huge cellar, but first of all, it's super clean. Um, after working harvest, I knew that I didn't want to be a winemaker because it seemed like most of the time was spent cleaning. <laughs> <laughs> and the cellar is so clean, like you literally can eat off the floor. So can you just walk us through like what the cellar looks like and what are some of the key um, special things about um, the Torrance cellar? Okay, so to only maybe to, to take it one step further backwards, almost to, to actually take it from the beginning and where the magic starts is of course the vineyards. Um, I think we... We spend a lot of time um, talking about that and, and for us the magic really starts in the vineyard. Um, I would say that in the cellar we don't want to manipulate wines. Um, we're working with the Bordeaux varieties which are really special in that they allow the terroir to really shine through if you allow the wine making process to almost step away from it. So, so first of all we're a, a small boutique cellar, um, 21 hectares of vineyards. On our property we've got two very distinct areas. Um, one is south facing, so a little bit colder, and one is directly west facing, which is a little bit warmer, so it gets all that afternoon sun, of course. So um, that's also what we planned our two wines, or one of uh, two of our two five wines around, is those two different areas. So the Fusion 5, um, a five variety Bordeaux blend, comes from the west facing side. The Detour and Z comes from the south facing side. So it's essentially a play on a more Left bank Cabernet dominated wine on the west facing um, aspects, a little bit warmer, and a colder aspect, which is the south facing one, where we planted more Merlot and, and Cabernet Franc. So those are the kind of the, the pivots around which the Turin works. So then you come to the farm, and, and we were actually the first guys in South Africa to produce a full five variety Bordeaux blend. So comprising of Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, Merlot, Malbec, and Petit Verdot. So that one was produced in 1999 called the Fusion 5. I'm sure most of you um, would have uh, worked with it in the past, would have uh, hopefully enjoyed it in the past as well. Um, so that was one of the first for the tour. And um, the reason why we actually decided on making a full five variety Bordeaux blend was because of the soils. So where we are situated, we're in the Polka Dry um, Hills. So facing the ocean. So the ocean is about 15 kilometers away from us. I almost want, just want to take my computer and, and turn it a little bit, but it's a little bit daisy, so you can't actually see the ocean today. So the soils are hugely diverse. So first of all, I always try and give a little bit of perspective. We're on something called the Kales River Pluton. Um, so that's more a geology term, a geological term for the, for the bedrock, for the mother material, which is 450 million years old. Wow. And I always think of it, it's such a cool thing that you can be a little speck in time um, on a soil that's so, much, so old. Um, but when you come a little bit closer to the top, um, it's decomposed granite and it is on a layer of clay that's still decomposing. But on that decomposed layer of, of granite, we've got 15 different soil types. Um, so in there, you've got soils that's a little bit more rocky, soils with a little bit more clay content, 
soils which are a lot more deeper, soils which are a little bit more shallow. And because of that diversity, we actually ended up doing a huge study of what varieties will fit on each soil. And that's where the idea of five variety um, blend actually came up because one of those soil types, one of those 15 soil types matched up perfectly to one of those varieties. Um, at that stage, of course, like I mentioned, there was no full five variety Bordeaux blend in South Africa. Um, so that's where the whole idea actually everything just clicked together as to why we are going to produce that. Um, then the second thing that we do at a tour and which makes us unique is that we were also the first winery in South Africa to work 100% with gravity. Um, and that's where the name de Touren actually comes in. So in the middle of our cellar, we've got this tower that goes up about four or five stories and it goes down into the ground one story. And in there, we've got a, a goods lift with a tank on it, a 5,000 liter tank. And that's how we will facilitate moving our wine from one level to another. So everything at the tour and, um, goes through that process of, of uh, moving it with gravity, except for ye uh, blending in the yeast right in the beginning of fermentation. Apart from that, everything will go through that tower um, and the gravity. Um, our cellar itself, uh, again, the whole philosophy is respecting the, the fruit as much as possible. So what we will do is um, all the focus goes into the, the vineyard part of it, making sure that you harvest the grapes at the perfect level of complexity, um, something that we can maybe talk about a little bit um, more as we go along. When the grapes arrive at the cellar, we've got a very extensive selection system. So essentially to take everything together, what we say is that we do not want to make wine from a berry that you would not like to eat. So the wine after grapes will go through a whole lot of selection systems. Um, and it will go through up to as much as 21 people before that berry is selected to go into the wine. And I think that's a huge deal um, when you go into that much quality. Because when you get that quality in your tank, you can re really be minimalistic in, in the techniques that you apply because the quality of the wine will actually just shine through from the quality of the berry. And that's the next process for us. So when you get to the cellar, of course, Tohani mentioned yeah, um, one of the most important things of, of making good wine, I believe, is, is having a clean cellar. I think that's really critical to, to making good wines. And then we've got a very simplistic setup. Um, so we've got uh, stainless steel tanks, open top stainless steel tanks, in which we will ferment all of our wines or most of our wines. And the tanks back then were designed to be as high as our wide. Now, you guys obviously visit a lot of, of uh, wineries, so normally you would have a tank that's X wide and it would be about 3X high. With that me method, you get a lot more. Um, volume or essentially tank space in a cellar. We said we're going to go the other route and we're going to waste a little bit of space if you want, but we're going to design the tanks to be just as wide as our high. And for that reason, you get a very natural high wine to, to juice ratio, which means that essentially you can work the cap a little bit less and still get the extraction that you want. Um, in essence, going softer and softer and softer. And I think that's Something that our wines are almost known for is that softness, um, the fineness of the tannins, um, the almost velvety tannins that you, you get to get, and that it's a, it's a lot to do with mouthfeel. And I think that's got to do a lot with the way that we respect the berries and that we respect the wine throughout the whole winemaking process. Um, a lot to do with our vineyard techniques and the use of the tower and gravity inside the cellar itself. Okay, so that's a brief overview of the, the cellar. Um, Tuani, anything else you would want to pursue um, as we go along? Um, otherwise, guys, really, the floor is open up for questions. I'd, I'd actually, rather than me babbling wrong, it, it's actually better if you've got very specific questions that we can answer and, and talk about for you. Yes, Silas. Yes, hi, Charles. How are you? 
fantastic Good yourself, uh, man. explanation you're doing right there. Uh, there is uh, just one question that I have concerning the gravity uh, way of, uh, you know, making sure that your wine is going through that process. I didn't quite get it really. I don't know whether you can recap to that and just maybe go into a little bit of details just for me to understand how that gravity works and the impact of that. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Uh, I think that's a very important question and that's actually what we base um, a winemaking philosophy on if you want. So if I can maybe just explain uh, the concept of how I think of gravity versus working with pumps, for instance. So if you've got two scenarios and the first scenario is working with a pump. So you're standing at the top of a flight of stairs and you want to walk to the bottom. So let's say you start walking the second step you slip and you fall all the way down to the to the bottom of the flight of stairs so what has happened here is you've gone from the top level to the bottom level um when i get to the bottom and i pick myself up i'm still charles williams so in essence i'm still the same person but if you look at me i dislocated my knee i've got a, a big laceration on my forehead and i've got a slight scratch on my arm so the moment that I pick myself up, I start healing. So I go to the doctor, he puts my knee back into place so I can start walking again, um, two or three stitches over here and a plaster for my scratch. So three months later, you see me walking down the road and what you will see is my knee is, knee is completely healed. Here we are at the laceration. That's, you can see the, the, the scar, but it's not open anymore, so it's fixed. And we are at the, only the scratch on my arm, that's completely healed. So that's what a wine goes through when it goes through a pump. So it will actually get all mangled up and then it starts healing itself again. Um, with gravity, it's as if you're walking down that flight of stairs and you're going from the top level to the bottom level. It takes you a little bit longer to get from the top to the bottom. But when you get to the bottom, you might only be winded. Um, so that's all based on, on if you're very fit or not. So I might have to take a breath. Um, I see you will probably not have to take a breath. So two minutes later, you see me and I'm completely the same as I was on top. And that's the difference between gravity and a pump. It's just because you're working softer, the molecules does not get as disrupted as it does with the pump. And that's the almost the essence of it. And then you start talking about things like if you're using, for instance, a peristaltic pump, they're much softer, um, they introduce much less oxygen. Um, so that is gonna be a better type of pump. Then you go to a mono pump, kind of good. And then you start going to these old stuff, which introduce a lot of, of oxygen. And um, if you still work with the centrifugal type pumps, they're horrible. Like they, they mix a wine up so that when you move it from one tank to another, you can't almost, imagine that it was the same one in the space of five minutes. Um, so that's why gravity is really special. And, and you'll go to the question as to why do not more winemakers use gravity then if it's such a special technique. And it basically comes back to time. Um, it's a really labor intensive process. It's a lot slower. Um, so I think it's one of the things that if you ask any winemaker, what would be his preferred method of working with wine and transferring wine in the cellar, it will always be gravity. Um, I think it's not always the most practical way um, and time efficient way to do it. Um, with our volumes, we're very fortunate that, that um, we can use gravity as a sole way of, of moving wine. And then also just maybe a little bit of a note um, that's gonna have a, a big influence on whether gravi gravity is better than a pump. It's at the time when you use it. So maybe to explain it in a little bit more of a scientific way. So if you've got um, grapes and you taste it, and specifically the skins and the pip, you're gonna get that astringent taste. And uh, so almost like um, drinking a cup of very strong tea. So that's tannins. So at that stage, the tannins is in a monomeric um, state. So it's in very short little chains. So when you taste it, it goes onto your taste buds and it will occupy a lot of your taste buds. And that's why you will get that dry sensation, almost that hard sensation. Um, now what will happen as soon as you start fermenting the wine, small amount of oxygen 
will come into contact with the tenants and they will start binding. Now, that bound tenant chain will still only occupy one taste bud. So it will almost become softer and softer as you go along. And that's why a wine that you're done fermenting and start barrel aging and eventually put into a bottle and you bottle age it for 10 years, that's why it becomes softer and softer and softer. It's because these tannins will combine and, and form more um, polymers, um, longer polymers. Um, and that's why if you pump young wine, it's not as bad. If you pump a wine just before bottling, it's really not great for the wine. Um, and that's where gravity becomes more and more and more important as you go along. Do we have any more questions? Carol, go ahead. Yes, I I Hi, Charles. Hi, everybody. Um, it's wonderful to have you on the line today. Um, your wines are absolutely phenomenal. Um, I have sold a few bottles of the Book 17 at Big Five Duty Free at the airport. And a particular customer from Asia asked me how the percentages of the blend vary vintage on vintage. And I tried to explain to him it was more sort of climate and terroir driven um, based on the, the, the various climatic conditions from that particular vintage. But he was looking for a much older one that was predominantly... Um, cab sav driven but had a high percentage of cab sav and i actually couldn't answer him i felt quite bad um are there any specific okay. ones more cab than than others yes um carol maybe and, and after i've done answering the question is i know all of you work with our wine so it, it might be good to just take the whole range from the bottom to the to the top um so the the book 17 and the black line it, it's much it's, it's this really um, unicorn wines for us. So what we did here um, is that we said, how do we make the best possible wine in the world? So I think whatever you do, um, whether you are um, in finances, whether you are attorney, um, us, of course, we're in the food and wine, uh, food and beverage um, in the, uh, industry. You always have to ask yourself the question, how do I make myself the best in the world at what I do? And that's actually where Book 17 was born. We asked that question. And back then, um, I got the present, and, and still I get the present every year, where Daniel, for instance, will tell me, we throw economics out of the window. We don't have to worry about the economic side of it. This is for us a venture to really go and say, how do we make the best wine from our farm? Um, and that's how it was born. So. Again, when you, when you look at the price point sometimes in South African rand, um, you do ask questions, why is it so expensive? You, so you start asking questions like, um, is it marketing related? Is it, is it um, a science experiment in the, in the cellar? And it, uh, the simple answer to that is absolutely not. It's about finding that really magnificent spots of terroir in the vineyard and using very accurate and very precise techniques to highlight that in the grapes and then be extremely respectful in the winemaking process to bring that across in the wine. So maybe how it starts is we, we took our 21 hectares. Um, back then we had accumulated about 50 years, the, the production team of, of farming our land. So we knew which spots we thought were quite special. Um, then we used aerial photography and we overlaid the knowledge we had with the aerial photography with our soil maps. And we found the soils that we thought is really special and we wanted to highlight that. So we work with three varieties um, predominantly here. Yeah. So it's, it's predominantly Cab Sauvignon, uh, Malbec and a little bit of Cab Front that normally goes into the wine. So those are the three wines from three different and very specific Sites. So some of them are south facing, some of them are west facing. Um, so the next step for us was if you go into a vineyard, you will always see in the perfect vineyard, you will walk, 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 walk. Um, everything will be perfect. And all of a sudden you will get to this vine, which is not perfectly balanced. So sometimes it's that it's just growing a little bit too strong. So the grapes that come from that, that plant will be a little bit too plush, a um, little bit almost diluted. The other way around, you sometimes get to a vineyard um, vine that's that's just not growing perfectly so it's, it's struggling too much and for that reason it kind of 
takes away from the, the concentration in the, the berry. The plant is actually just trying to stay alive. So it's not focusing on the grapes. So we will go to a level where we will actually declassify vines in that soil and spot of vineyard that we want to use. The next step for us is we select the best six to eight bunches. So we've got a few criteria which we believe makes for superior bunches and we'll select it based on that. The next step that we will go through is we will then go on the berry, on the vine still and look at each and every bunch. So normally you've got a bunch, you've got a little shoulder here at the top and the bottom part. So we see that as three different unities. So the, 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 the shoulder will get cut off. Um, we do the same for the Turin production, for the, for the book 70, uh, for the Fusion 5 and the Turin Z. But we will even cut off that bottom few berries because we just find that they ripen a little bit later than the top ones. Um, we expose the berries here from the beginning to the sunlight. Um, of course, the vines have got a little bit less um, grapes on it. It uses the water that is available to it a little bit better. So the berries don't usually um, burn quite easily. So for that reason, we open up the canopies on both sides, extreme. Um, we expose the berries to a lot of sun. And what that is going to do is it's going to channel the enzymes in the berry to create more phenols. So you get a little bit more tannins. Um, you get a little bit more precursors of aroma. So you essentially you grow a berry that's much richer and much more complex. I think that's the difference where book 17 um, compared to some of, it com of its competitors, a lot of that is, is barrel selection. So it's purely going into your cellar and finding the best barrels. Um, what we do here is we actually say that we want to highlight the terroir and we want to do it through growing the grapes the best on the terroir. So once we've done that, we will pick the berries when it's perfectly ripe. And then we go through a very strenuous um, process of selecting each and every berry. Now, Tuani, I don't know if you, I don't think you were still at the tour and where we went through that oh, process. Of course I was. You were, like, okay, so you can tell the people what a pain in the ass I am. <laughs> so, so what do we actually do? It's literally oh, like they come with these carts, carts and carts of berries, right? And on the surface, they look great. Like you're like, okay, what's wrong with these berries? But you literally have to pick each berry that looks like perfect. It can't have a dent. It can't be wrinkled a little bit. It's like berry by berry, not bunch by bunch, literally. And there's all these wonderful ladies and they're sitting at the table and they're so serious. I was trying to make small talk, but no, everybody's just like focused on picking these berries. So you pick the very best berries and then the rest of them. What do you do with the rest of them? We actually the compost. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that, I think you should give me those berries so I can make some 20 juice, but yes, um, that's what happens. <laughs> It's so special, but it's, it's, it's like love though, because it's like every single step of the process is just so much love. Like we even foot trotted the, the, the berries after that. So like actually the winemaker was the assistant winemaker was like, Hey, do you want to, you know, do you want to crush these grapes? And I was like, huh? And he was like, okay, come on, let's clean your feet. And then they dropped me in like this big tank of berries. And literally, with my bare feet, I've just crushed the berries. So special. Okay, so you you know what my twenty? It was twenty eighteen that you worked here. Yeah, twenty eighteen. Oh, so uh, we know what made that special now. <laughs> I know. No, okay, so I that's the buy a bottle of it. <laughs> it's, it's delicious. Um, so we're just waiting for lockdown to end. Um, then we're going to send it out to the world. So, um, yeah. But, but that's actually the next step is, is once you get that berries in, um, now we want to look for perfection. Now, the, the book 17 is a little bit easier because you're working with the Bordeaux variety. So like Tuani said, there is quite easy. Um, what you want for is complexity concentration. But what's very sometimes easy to, to when you're looking at the higher bracket or the, the more, almost, just give me a moment, I just want to see. Hang up that. Um, so I think when you look at the best wines of the world and you start thinking about Napa Valley, the cult wines, you think of the Super Tuscans, Italy, um, 
you you start thinking very ripe, very expressive, very we call it blockbuster. And that I was very lucky to work at, at a real top winery, one of those cult wineries in, in Napa Valley. And that's the preconceived idea with which you go over to that winery is that it's just going to be harvesting extremely ripe. It's going to be big, massive. And it, it took me about two months of working there before I got to taste the wine. And I was blown away because it's the most elegant wine you will ever taste. It's, it's really expressive, but it's, it's just the, the thing that impresses you about the wine is the elegance of it. And I think that's what I always envision for book 17 um, is it, it must first of all impress you with its elegance, its complexity, um, just the depth of aromas. And then you must start getting the power and, and the expression coming in and, and, and really filling it up. And that's where the selection of the berries comes in. Um, now, because we want to have this really expressive berry, we do let the grapes hang quite long, which means that X percent of them will actually get overripe and you will get X percent that's not quite perfectly ripe at the end. We try and limit the unripe portion to, to a maximum. The, the portion that is perfectly ripe will be probably about 85% of the, the bunch. But because as your bunch is hanging in the sun, this area here will get a lot of sunlight. So some of that berries may get a little bit jammy, a little bit overcooked. And that's where the human factor comes in. Um, as soon as you start to think, putting things through machines, berries hop off the stems, um, it becomes part of the winemaking process. So we want to make sure that we can add. Okay, there we go. So we want to remove every berry that's not perfect and then go and pick every single berry um, that is perfect. And that's where you make a lot of that quality is just by finding the, the selection and getting that right. Um, next step is like to Arnie said there, we just want to, squeeze the berry to get some juice going. Again, the berries, when we harvest them, they are quite concentrated. So we're gonna squeeze some of the berries um, by foot. It's, it's specifically by foot, because you can go and do the test yourself, um, even with grapes that you buy from the, the supermarket. If you squish it with your foot, it's impossible to break a pip. And that's actually why we, we do it by foot. So you're gonna squeeze the berries to a certain degree to get the juice going. And then we're gonna do a, a very slight sanyate. So we're gonna, we're gonna take about between 10 and 15% of the juice away from, this, from, the, from the berries and from the fermentation, just to increase the concentration that little bit again. Um, from there, we go into the, the berries will be transferred into barrels. So we will actually ferment the berries inside a barrel. And that's where the winemaking side becomes very minimalistic. So we will use a natural fermentation to start it. If we like the natural fermentation, it will continue all the way through. If we think we can be uh, or do a little bit better with a selected yeast, we will actually go that route. The method of extraction is just by rolling the barrels. So there's no punch times, no pump overs. We literally just roll the barrels. So some vintages every two hours, some vintages six times a day, some vintages only four times a day. It's all dependent on, on what the grapes actually gives you. Um, that process will continue for almost a month and a half to two months. Um, and it's really important that grape contact that you get. So this is something that I learned in, in America working with those cold wines is that if you can work very softly with your grapes and you can keep it on the skins a little bit longer, after about 30 days of, of um, after picking it, so fermentation will take about, about 12 days, you will get to this really complex peak. Um, so imagine a sinus curve going through. You will get to this really complex peak, um, which is a little bit more fruit driven. So that's normally where we will harvest uh, or, or press, anyways, your Fusion 5 and your Deuterant Z. So what happens after that, if you keep applying skin contact as opposed to fermentation maceration is that you will almost lose a little bit of that integration and you will start going down. And normally around about day 40, you always have it in the back of your mind that you do the right thing by not pressing it at that level. But what will 
happen time after time around about day 50, you will start picking up and you will start going to the next curve. And the level of complexity that you reach on this plateau over here is a lot richer. So you get a, a added level of texture almost, I want to say. And that's something that I think comes really through strongly in your book 17. So we will press it here. Um, we've got the small little basket press and I imagine that's the most expensive press in the world because we actually just use it as a sieve. So we'll screen the berries through there. Some vintages we do press it lightly. Some vintages we actually just screen to separate the wine and the, and, and the skins. You can imagine after 60 days, all the great stuff that you want to have extracted um, should be extracted into your wine. Um, from there, wine will go into the, the same barrel where it actually fermented it. So two barrels of fermentating berries will give you one barrel of finished wine. And that will then be allowed to, to age for about 20 to 24 months. Then we get to the blending process. Um, and that's maybe, Carol, sorry, I had a very long turn that I took now with that answer. But that's where you get to the, to the um, actual blending part of it. So we envision this wine to be more of a feeling, um, to express the vintage. So there's no set rule. So that's also why we don't put the, the percentages at the back of the bottle. Is we're trying to convey a feeling here. Um, almost, I want to say, a bit more of a style, an expression of the vintage, rather than just a blend. So we're almost going the way that Bordeaux went and say, if you look at a Bordeaux bottle of wine, you don't find the, the percentages at the back. You might start finding it from a few years ago, but up until a few years ago, they expect you, when you're getting it from St. Julien, they want you to know what's in there. And if you're getting it from Pomerol, they kind of expect you to know what, what's in there. Um, but to answer your question, so it goes from a year when we had a blend, um, some of the earlier vintages, uh, which was 45% Cabernet, 45% Malbec, 10% Cab Franc, to vintages when you have 50% um, Cabernet Sauvignon, 20% um, Malbec, 30% uh, Cab Franc. So it does vary quite a bit. Um, for us, it's much more about expressing that distinct vintage. Um, that we think the, the grapes would, would have liked us to express, in essence. Um, if you do want the specific details, I can always send that for you. It, it, it's absolutely no problem. I can see in your really detailed sheets on that, so I must just get your details at the, at the end, and I can definitely do that for you. But it does vary. So in recent times, I think the style has matured to a slight more cabinet dominance. So I think we... We're playing in the region of about 60 to 70 percent Cabernet. Um, Cabernet Franc has come a little bit more to the fore, and Malbec is just where in the initial vintages, I think it was quite a, a predominant variety in there. It's just stepped a little bit back. Um, and that was just as we were finding the kind of the essence of the wine and, and how we think it would be best expressed. Um, I have a question about the blending. Okay. So at the point where you're blending it, is that when you start to mix in the Sagne or when do you do that? What do you do with that wine? No, the, the Sagne we will actually um, completely remove here because it's, it's not necessarily, it's too concentrated to make rosé from. So you can't even use it as a, as a byproduct, I almost want to say. Um, so the Sagne will be excluded from this whole process. It, it, it's one of the, it's probably the most expensive Sagne to lose. Uh, in the way that we grow the grapes, but the, it's going to get discarded in essence. Um, what we what we do when we say and, and this might have happened a little bit more in the background when you were here is we do taste the grapes. So we will say again, you don't want to overdo anything. Um, so before we get the grapes in, we've already got a, a very good idea of of what's happening in the seeds, in the skin, and in the pulp, um, because we do phenolic testing on these before. And so you, you know that you're gonna have a lot of skin tannins. Um, we know that because we're gonna have, basically the way that I explained that we grow it, you know you're gonna have a lot of um, seed tannins, or skin tannins. You're not gonna have as much seed tannins, again, because you're exposed to a lot of sunlight, so a lot of that gets denaturated. Um, and then you kind of guess, and this is a, through a, a series of getting to know the wine 
and getting to know the process of making the wine, how much you want to sanye to get the concentration and amplify the complexity without overdoing it. I think that's kind of the, the finer arts almost of, of making wine. I think that's where your winemaker, you will not find me saying this a lot, that's where I think the winemaker adds his value in the winemaking process. It's determining are you going to treat the berries in the vineyard and then are you going to express what the berries or the story that the berries wants to convey without manipulating it too much in the cellar. So I have another question about the blending. So is it like one big party for the most part where you guys are, um, like, do you guys just all sit in a room and take all the wines and then taste and like, who's on that panel? What is that like? Can you talk to us about the actual blending, the blending process for that day or days when you guys are blending? Okay, so I'm going to do it in two portions. So I'm first going to actually maybe start off with the, with the Fusion and Z because we've got a very unique method about going, um, actually determining the final blend. So this year with COVID, we had to do it in-house. So Daniel, myself, um, the winemaker, Marta Furi, the viticulturalist, um, Albi, we, we do a lot of testing in-house um, to determine the blend. But normally we actually open it up a little bit um, to our clients, to the trade, um, to people that's actually going to be drinking the wine. Um, of course, I think we, we've got a very good idea of, of what the wine will be at the end. But it's always good to, to just ask the people that will actually at the end of the day spend the money on the wine and that will actually be the people that enjoys it, what they think about the wine. So, it starts off with a very simple process and that's by evaluating each and every batch that we make. So between the five varieties, um, the different clones, the different root stocks, we end up making anything between in small vintages, 35, upwards to big vintages like 2020, um, 55 different components. So these components, we will then match up to very specific barrels. We will taste these throughout the year. So every month we will do one or two tastings and you will really get to familiarize yourself with what's in a barrel. And this is very important. I always explain it. It's like having kids. Um, so you guys said that they have kids. This time it's quite tough having kids in COVID times. <laughs> uh, they drive uh, up the walls. But, but when you got little babies, um, you don't know their personality yet. So that's you can compare it to having wine that's in the tank, they're fermenting. You, you kind of know, it's a boy or a girl, you know that already, but you haven't found out their personalities yet. Now they start getting older. So you put them in a barrel after malolactic fermentation and you will start seeing that they develop certain traits. Um, that's how you start realizing your, your one toddler, for instance, my, my first child, she's extremely shy, um, introvert, uh, likes to play on her own. The second girl is actually like a boy. She's just bouncing off the walls. So now you're starting to realize which every child is. And that's very important. So through a process of, of 12 months, we'll taste all those batches. We'll get to know them. So by the time that you're actually starting to blend, you already know the history of how the vintage look. So you know what you want to express. Because like, always think about wine. You want to express vintage and you want to express place. Because if you, if you are true to those two things, your neighbor can't make the wine that you have. Um, that's what makes wine unique, is, is vintage and place. Um, so the first step for us will be to see what works and what doesn't work. So because we're working with blends, we're working with synergies. So that's something that I had to realize like right in the beginning is just taking all your top scoring wines and throwing them in one blend you're probably not going to end up with the best possible blend that you can make. Um, sometimes you will take a quarter of your best wines and you'll put some of your least like, let's call it least like wine into the blend and you'll make a superior blend. So it's all about synergies and wines that work in antagonism with each other. So before we start screening this out to the panels. I will sit with a lot of wines. I will make up a lot of blends. I'll taste, I'll experiment. And then I'll go with a panel of normally around about 10 wines, which we will take to people and we'll say, okay, 
these wines, um, seven out of them, we believe could go into a bottle and everybody will be perfectly happy with them. Um, three of them a little bit more experimental. So we do test all that combination that's in there. And then we'll ask a big panel of sommeliers, um, F&B managers. Um, very important, you want to have that clients um, and ourselves. We'll ask the question, which wines do you like? Which is not necessarily your favorite? Um, we'll ask the question very open-ended. So you can score it with smiley faces. You guys would probably score it on a 100-point scale. Um, your client can tell you, this is the one that I want to drink. That's the one I don't necessarily want to drink too much of. You guys can go a little bit deeper into, this is the tannin structure that I like. I like the acidity on this wine, um, the complexity. And, and we take all that information and we go back to the drawing board and we see the blends that did really well. Is there certain things that we can see works in synergy? And can we play off that and try and make even better blends? Or is there some, some things that work antagonistically towards each other? And once we start getting that together, you actually open up a whole new field for yourself and, and you will then go back to the drawing board, make up some more blends with all that data that you collected. Um, go back to a panel. Most of the times, yeah, you've, you've got it fixed. Um, by this time, normally you've got a blend that, that kind of will start separating itself. But we might even go to a third round and do it again. So before we actually decide on a wine, you sometimes make upwards of 50 little micro blends um, before you get to that one. And to, to give you an idea of the, the size of the task, like I said, we've got sometimes upwards of, of let's, let's call it an average of 30, 45 batches of wine. Those batches of wine might have one or two coopers allocated to them, each of them. Then you will have different levels of barrel ages. So you will have new barrels, second full barrels, third full barrels. You will have maybe one or two toasting levels. So if you put all of that on a spreadsheet, that's the amount of options that you have to blend with. So it's, it's quite a huge task um, to actually get to that final answer. So that's only for the fusion. Then we start going to the Z, um, same process. Then we go over to the Delicat. Um, and we've got a, a second label called Diversity. That's normally a little bit easier because by that time, um, diversity is, a, is a, we call it the, the best of the rest. Um, we had too much cabinet and too much Merlot planted on our farm um, based on the soil, but also to give you the options to, to make the best possible and diverse um, fusion and Z. So the, the diversity will normally be just be a blend of cabinet and Merlot, which is a little bit easier. For the Book 17, going into that, Tuani, there we're going to do it much, we do it in our, in, in essence. So it's also a lot smaller. So you only have five battles, as you know, of the Book 17. So you've got two or three battles of Cab, um, one or two battles of, of Malbec, and one battle of Cab Front. So yeah, it's just about finding that perfect synergy. So we'll spend a lot of time just defining, 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 getting to that perfect spot. So it, it's probably the same amount of effort, although you only have five options to play with. Um, but you have to get to that sweet spot um, and you've got less options if something you want to tweak. Um, so it's, it's actually a little bit more technical with the book 17 stuff to get that perfect balance. Sorry, you're still on unmute. So the black line, of course, is 100% Syrah, but there is some blending there because you have the Syrah from the three different um, places, right? So you have the Swetland and then you have the Stellenbosch Syrah. Do you do the same thing with the percentages of the blending or do you just mostly say, how do you do the, the book 17 as far as, I mean, not book 17, black line. Oh. Since it's so black line is... Maybe just to explain the, the black line, um, I'm sure again, most of you would have um, worked with it and, and, and hopefully tasted it and, and drank a bottle. So it's, it's um, from the success that we got from the, the book 17, I think when we did it, uh, we were really amazed by the results and, and I think everything worked according to what we envisioned for that one. And we almost felt that we want the avenue to explore that techniques a little bit more and, and just the creative side and the almost 
playful side away from your core business, which is Fusion and Z. Um, for us, that avenue was Syrah. So it's, it's something that we all love to drink. It's, it's a variety we love. So that was a really nice avenue for us to, to do that with. We ourselves, I think we, we think that our strong point is blending. Um, we, like I say, our whole portfolio is built around making blends. And because you're working with a single variety, we still wanted to have that absolute complexity in the wine. And that's where the idea came from looking at different areas, first of all, because um, the Swartland is going to give you a vastly, completely different profile from what you will get in Stellenbosch. So we first identify what we wanted for the wine. So the wine itself is a little bit more of a powerhouse. So it's, it's definitely not Rome style, uh, much closer to what you will get from California. Um, I once had in a blind tasting Synchronon and I would have given that as a dead ringer for, for Black Lion. Um, so it's much more in that style, a little bit more for Australian style, not necessarily as sweet. It's a bit more steer, but, but definitely a bit more powerful. Um, so for that reason, we picked very specific vignettes in very specific portions, um, basically size of vignettes. Um, so we found an area in the Swartland, which um, forms the core of this wine. Um, there's an area in the, the Porca Dry, which is very close to us, which we use. And then an area in the foot slopes of the Yaldeberg. So on that coffee stone, that really iron rich stones. Um, now each of these brings something different to the party. So the Swartland brings a lot of expression, a lot of power. It's just an amazing wine. Um, but the Swartland on its own is a blockbuster. It's one of those hugely powerful, hugely impressive. It's, it's one of those wines, if you can give somebody just one sip, and you really want to impress them. That's the one that I always go for. Um, because it's a lot of everything. But unfortunately, I think if you put only that in the bottle, it's just a little bit too much. You can't drink a bottle of that. And that's where we had the different areas of the, the Stellenbosch coming together. So from that coffee stone iron rich soils, we get a lot of um, almost, uh, what do you call it? Restraint. I think that's a good word to explain it. So you get a lot of that really typical um, Shiraz characteristics, really fine tannin structure, but everything is restrained. So this is the wine that's actually going to pull everything together. And then we've got a little bit of Shiraz from the Polka Dry, of course, a little bit of a colder area. And that grapes will give us a lot more freshness, a lot more um, younger berries, um, so that's going to be the, the fresh, elegant part that we will bend back. So you've got power, you've got the restrained wine in the middle that will pull everything together. So it's just going to rein this one in. It's just going to lift the fresh side a little bit up. And then you've got the fresh component um, just to bring everything together again. So to honor, yeah, exactly. It's, it's about finding the sweet spot in all of that chaos. Um, because again, blends is all about synergy. So you want to find that spot where synergy is that perfect. And, and sometimes it means something as little as taking the Swartland component up by 2%, dropping the, the Yaldeberg portion by 0.5%, um, lifting this by 1%. It's, it's all those little small details that will make the synergy click. So I know that um, you guys make your wine so that they're um, ageable and so that they're age worthy. So hard for me because I have a bottle of the Black Lion that I bought in 2000 and I think it was 2016 I bought the Black Lion. I think, I can't remember the year, but I'm holding on to it for sure and I don't want to drink it, um, but it's so hard. So can you tell me what's the difference between a wine that you buy in the grocery store, I mean, and a wine that's meant to be aged? Like, what do you do special? Okay, Tuani, I think it, the, the first answer is, is actually going back to the vineyard. So there's, there's two things. So when you want to drink a wine immediately, um, so let's say next year you want to drink a 20, um, well, let's say the, the, in this year you want to drink a 2019 red wine. So there's going to be a lot of components that needs to come in together to make that wine enjoyable. 
So if you're going to have a 2019 red one, and there is some of them out on the market already, it needs to be soft, it needs to be smooth. Most of those wines won't have a big phenolic content, so it won't be very tannin rich. It will be easier drinking styles. Um, if you taste our 2019 right now, it's still in the barrel. We just finalized the fusion concept blend. We we in the process of, of determining the Z. Those are really wines that are still really rough around the edges. It's work in progress. So it comes back to, to first of all, terroir. If you've got a superior terroir, your level of complexity will go to maybe let's say this level. If you're making an easy drinking wine that should just go into the market right now, you take sometimes a lot of, that's where it becomes profitable for those guys to do their business. They're in a lesser terroir, but they can grow a lot of grapes. So their complexity level will only maybe rise to here, but they can get a lot of grapes over here. Um, so that's going to be, I think the driver of quality is always terroir. And the driver of ageability will always be terroir. Then you start going into vineyard technique. So by not allowing the vine to mature all the grapes that nature would give it. So let's say you get um, 20 tons per, per hectare and you ripen it. So you're not going to ripen it to its full complexity. You're only going to be able to ripen it to a certain level. What we do is we make sure on a, on a vine level, on a shoot level, that every shoot should be able to ripen the bunch that is on it. If you step a, a meter back and you look at the vine, there must be absolute complexity. So every shoot should be able, of every vine should be able to ripen its load to perfection. That's where you get again that scenario where here's the level of, of quality you can get. This is the level of quality you can potentially get. Then you start going into winemaking techniques. So we work a little bit more minimalistic. So you retain a lot of that phenolic content throughout the winemaking process. And that's very important for ageability. The other guy over here um, on the easier drinking side, they will actually make their wine with less phenolic content. So less skin contact, um, fining agents, they want to take a lot of that phenolic content out of the wine, actually, to make it smoother to drink. Um, they will use different yeasts. So we, we use yeast that will enrich the flavor profile. It will enrich the, the phenolic content and that whole um, uh, complexity factor. If you're going to make a wine that needs to go into the market young, you actually want to use a, a yeast that's going to give you a lot of, of fruity components but it's not going to play much on the texture and the, the, the phenolic content. And then um, winemaking techniques as well, the way that you're going to punch it down, the way that you're going to press it, that's all going to have an influence. At the end of the day, the way that you barrel age it, the type of wood you use, that's going to all have an influence. Um, so I think it, it actually stems back from terroir and then everybody's business model as well. Like, again, all of us is in the, the business to make wine. For some of us, the where you can make your business work is on that level because you don't have a lot of ground soil, but you've got really good soil to make a higher end product. And then on the other guys, they don't necessarily have a superior terroir, but they can grow a lot of grapes and market it at a, let's say, the everyday enjoyable wine. Um, so we play that everything, because you've got much more of everything, you want that all to settle down. And that's where if you think about Bordeaux, for instance, and I mean, that's also changing now, but 20, 30, 40 years ago, you had to set the bottle of Bordeaux down for, for 10 years before everything comes together. And that's just because as you've got all this potential in there, it just needs to come all together to point where it actually click and becomes enjoyable. But at the point where it becomes enjoyable, your level of enjoyment is much better than if you start over here at a very low level um, of complexity and age it for that time. Sorry, I know it's uh, that was maybe not the, the best structured answer, but hopefully I, I answered your question. No, that did, that did. I mean, my takeaway was that that was, it's important to have texture, terroir, and technique and then the type of grape. So like that definitely answered my question. Um, I just want to say that Daniel had to leave, but he told me to say um, goodbye to everyone and 
Yes, and to give his regards. So um, can you talk about, does anybody else have any questions? Because I'm sorry, I can go on and on and on talking about No, please, about please do ask. Silas, yes. Let me uh, meet you. Uh, I do have a couple of questions and I must really say a big thank you to Charles because that was a very, very candid explanation. I've never heard a winemaker go this detailed into explaining, you know, this process to us like he did, Charles. Thank you very much. However, I have a oh, couple pleasure. of questions and I will start maybe by taking you back to um, the phenolic ripening that you talked about where you allow, you expose your, your bunches into the sun. I read somewhere and it was talking about uh, not allowing too much sun to allow the slow phenolic ripening. And in this case, you're talking about exposing your, your, your bunches into some sun to make sure that you have that uh, ripening that, that you, you need. So can you just go back and try to tell us uh, which is ideal or rather how do you strike a balance between okay. your grapes to the sun and allowing them to slow, uh, have what we call a slow phenolic ripening and clarify that. Uh, the second question is obviously about the process of making wine. And in this case, you're talking about using barrels. And we've seen a number of winemakers not going into using barrels while making red wines. Of course, they say the reason behind this is uh, hygiene issues and stuff like that, and how difficult it is to ferment red wine in barrels, but you're doing that. So how did you choose that? Um, of course, you've given a number of reasons that you did that, but how do you go about taking care of that uh, hygiene aspect and all the other reasons that people do? And then, of course, the use of natural yeast, of course, to using, you tried to clarify that. And uh, maybe the question that I'll ask is, how do you predict the outcome of, of what you're going to achieve at the end of the day if you allow natural yeast to take care of your fermentation? And then talking about keeping your wines in maceration for between, or for up to maybe 30 to 40 days, and we're talking about grape varieties that are known to have very high THC and tannin. Uh, do you not over extract? And if you do, how do you counter this? So basically, those are my questions. Thank you. Sorry, Silas, um, I got all of them. The, the last question, can you maybe just repeat that? Um, uh, it broke up a little bit. Uh, you say something about extraction, over extraction. Um, you can just repeat uh, that question, you, please. Okay, you were talking about keep doing the maceration for, a, for an extended period. You're talking about the 12 days of maceration and fermentation, which is basically the ideal days. But then you go ahead and keep that to up to 40 days, 30 to 40 days. So my worry was, is there a chance of having over extraction of perhaps tannin and knowing that the grapes that you're working with are grapes that are known to have very high levels of tannin, like the Cabernets and Cabernet Franc. So please tell us how you strike a balance in that as well. Okay. Um, first of all, thank you for that. That's really technical questions and I love to answer that. Um, if you've got any follow-up questions, just put up your hand as I'm talking and um, for any of you guys, uh, and, and I'll try to explain it as best as possible. So, so what you read is correct. Um, you've got to look at terroir. So if you're in a, um, I'm going to first take it as you, as you mentioned them. So the first one is the phenolic ripeness and what the impact of sunlight, temperature, um, wind is going to have on all of that. So there's certain things that stimulate phenolic ripeness. So phenolic ripeness gets channeled through an enzyme called PAL, phenyl, Phenyl alanine liasa. Sorry, that's in Afrikaans now. Um, but it's, it's essentially PAL. So there's at certain times when the berry um, express these um, enzymes. So it's a genetic um, structure in them. And at certain times they will get expressed. So one of those times is raisin. So that's when the berries goes from green to black. Now, the things that will influence the expression and the amplitude of expression, so how much get expressed, has a lot to do with, with factors that's related to terroir. So one of the main driving factors of expression is going to be temperature, and the other one is sunlight. So now you've got to start differentiating between terroir. So I'm going to take the two extremes, and I'm actually going to leave Stellenbosch out of the, the situation here, and I'll come back to it just in a moment. 
So let's take two scenarios. You've got a, a grapevine, Cabernet Sauvignon, ripening in Elgin, and you've got one ripening in the Swartland. So in the Swartland, what you said now is 100% correct. If you're going to overexpose that berry, the temperatures will become so massive that that enzyme will actually be underexpressed again. So there's an optimum temperature um, for the expression of PAL, which is 35 degrees. Um, but now you must think of a black skin berry. So if the ambient temperature is 35 degrees, the outside of that berry is at 60 degrees. And you can go and, and look at it. I actually took a near infrared gun one day and I, I went to a bunch of exposed berries and, and that's, that's what you've got to look at is the amount of hours where that berry is actually way above 35 degrees. But now you take that same vine and you go to Elgin. Now Elgin is of course a lot colder. So that's where you can expose that berry. You will actually um, increase the temperature of the grapes from the ambient, which will be in the mid twenties to around about 35. Um, maybe just a little bit over and that's where the optimum place is for phenolic accumulation. So if you're going to overexpose a bunch in the Swartland versus in Elden, over here you're actually going to lose on phenolics. What's going to happen here is you're going to have a low phenolic content, you're going to have a high sugar content and that's where you start making that really jammy, uh, I think flabby, Almost, I think that's what Napa sometimes get a little bit of flag for is, is that really ripe, overripe style. Um, on this side again, you're going to get a berry where the sugar content, because it's so cold and not necessarily suited to Cabernet Sauvignon or um, Elgin, you're going to get a berry with a lot of phenolic content, but you might not get the sugar content. And that's where, even if you go to, to Stellenbosch, where we are situated on the Paul to Dry Hills, you're about three degrees colder than Stellenbosch City. Um, if you go out to the non corp side, it will start increasing to four or five degrees. So that is why we, we can actually open up the berries much more where, where we are situated. And everything that we do will actually stimulate the phenolic um, accumulation. Um, the other thing, of course, for phenolic content is, is sunlight. So before the raisin, if you expose the berries, you will um, increase the expression of PAL. You will get more phenolic content after the raisin. So that's actually when, there's, when the skins have already colored up. If you get a lot of sunlight on it, it will start breaking it down. And that's where as a viticulturalist and a winemaker, you've got to be very clever with row direction, where your wind is going to come from, how your sun is going to eat it. Because, I mean, you're not talking one dimensional here, you're talking the sun will rise from the west, but your rose might be just slightly slanted. So you're going to have nice direct sunlight on it for the morning part, which will be about three, four, five hours. Then you want to leave a leaf just on top of the bunch of a year. So from 11 o'clock when the sun is really hot, you don't actually want ex, um, direct sunlight on it, but you want reflection from the ground up to your bunch. Then for the hottest part of the day, you want to have your, your berries in the shade actually again. And then in the evening, so five o'clock, when we get that sea breeze coming in, you want some diffuse sunlight. So it's a really a multi-pronged answer. You know, you're going to attack it. Um, hopefully that answers you. So you can overexpose it. Um, it is correct that what the literature say, to Ani, I'm going to be right now. Um, it is correct what the literature say that if you're in a warm climate and you overexpose it, you're actually going to lose on phenolic content. Um, if you're in too cold an area, you're not going to get the phenolic content because the temperature is too low for that gene to express itself um, really well. If you're in that kind of sweet spot, so above 25 to very low 30s, based on how you manipulate your plant and your terroir, um, that's where you can play whether you're going to actually make more or make less. To Ani. So from, just from what you said, it, I take it that grapes can like hold in a little bit of the warmth. So is that why wine regions that have cooler nights are so ideal? That's the first part of my question. And then the second part is, can you talk a little bit, when I was there at the Torn Working Harvest, I saw this um, spreadsheet that was basically um, this tracking of infrared pictures that you guys would take of the vines. 
does that play a part in you monitoring the, the temperatures in the vines at all? Um, okay, so the, the first part of it is, oh, I forgot now, what was the first part of it? <laughs> oh, sorry, the first part of it is, to on it's actually, it's not that the grapes retain the, the temperature, so on a very short term, yes, so if it's really hot um, at lunchtime, if you're in the direct sunlight, you're outside of the berry, will get warmer and it will be retained for a certain amount of time. But um, I think it's much more to do with, with um, time spent at a certain temperature, if I can call it like that. So um, it, it's not really technical and it sometimes go over to being a little bit too academic. Um, the question that you asked Silas, I think it's a very academical question and that's why I actually love answering it. Um, so what will happen is you must look at the amount of time which you are in the sweet spot both for sunlight radiation and for temperature. Um, and that's why I mentioned, you've got to look at row direction. Are you going to manipulate the leaves on your eastern side? Are you going to manipulate it on your western side? Um, the moment that you start going over, let's say 40 degrees absolute temperature on your berry, that's where the berry actually just shuts down. Um, you, you get a lot of water loss through evaporation but metabolically the berry shuts down and nothing happens. So that's why if you're going to leave your berry in the sunlight versus just in the shade, you might have a, a difference of about, let's say 10 degrees, just based on the actual radiation onto the berry. And, and that's what I mean with temperature and, and the grapes will direct sunlight might go as up as high as 55, 60 degrees on the outside of that berry. Whereas if you've got just one layer of leaves, on the other side, you might be a lot colder and it might put you in that sweet spot where you can actually um, stimulate a little bit more of that phenolic um, content. Uh, second part of your question. Red, the infrared pictures that you guys take of the ah. vine, does that monitor the temperature or does that, what are you doing with those pictures? Okay, so Tuani, those were, those were near infrared pictures they measure the energy at which the plant is growing. So you do get solar radiation um, pictures as well, uh, but that is still in a kind of a more of a development stage. So the pictures that you saw will tell us the different levels of growing potentials in the vineyard. So essentially how it works is, is near infrared comes from the sun, green growing, and now you're gonna excuse my English, um, green growing photosynthesizing, oh, I got it right today material will reflect near infrared back into the atmosphere. So that reflection is what you capture. So now I'm going to put you scenarios. So let's say you're in the Amazon forest, which is hugely densely packed with vegetation. So basically all the near infrared that's coming from the sun will get reflected back and it will get, get captured on that picture. The other way around, if you go to the Sahara desert, most of that near infrared rays will eat the sun, uh, the, the sand, and get absorbed. So no reflection will be captured. And that's what that picture is actually just captured. It, it, it kind of finds that areas with a little bit more vegetation and a little bit less biomass. Um, based on that, you can make certain correlations. So you would have seen on that maps, we do it on a, on a vineyard level. So even in one vineyard, you can have huge differences in in the level of growth in your vines. And if you now start looking at the psyche of a vine, so if a vine is perfectly balanced, it's in the psyche of saying, let's the, make the kids perfectly ripe. So it puts all its focus into the grapes. Um, if a vine, let's say the one or two vines on the end of the row, they've got a little bit more resources, purely for the reason that they're not competing with as many vines around them. They will always be a little bit stronger. So because they are stronger growing vegetatively, they will say, we don't have to worry about the kids as much. So they will actually not put all their focus into getting the, the grapes as perfect. And we've got to go and manipulate them a little bit. Um, so the one will have a little bit more reflection on that picture, the one a little bit less. And that's what it does. It gives us an opportunity to go and examine those different areas taste if we can actually taste the difference, do one or two phenolic tests and see if there's a difference in the phenols. And if there is something different to honey, then we can actually harvest those areas separately and at separate times to make sure that we get the best out of each of them. 
Okay. That's that. I want to read. Okay, cool. Silas, then I'm going to your your next question of barrel choices. So, like you say, this has got to do a lot with wine style. Um, first of all, I think if you envision a wine that's a little bit um, easier drinking, much more elegant, expressing the more primary um, side of, of, of grapes and of wine, then you're going to go and say, I'm going to either use no barrels um, or I'm going to use older barrels that's already been used three, three four, five, six, seven times. Um, that's also sometimes where you get the hygiene is, uh, um, issues, by the way. Um, what we look at is, is, and this is something that comes through a, a long time, is you look at what oak will amplify and work synergistically towards making your wine a better wine. So which one will basically just be the wine that, of the barrel that brings it all together. So for us, we use French oak, um, predominantly 95%. We use a little bit of American oak on our Malbec. And then we use it from very specific forests. So the, the issue, on, and I think Duani, this is actually maybe a nice topic for you guys, if you can line up one of those um, poopers to give you a, a, a nice in-depth talk on what goes into making a barrel of or a wine barrel. I, it's absolutely amazing and it is almost as complex as making wine. So the forest from where the, the, the wood comes has a huge impact. The soil will have a huge impact. Um, on the flavor and of the grain that you're going to expect in the barrel. So we use three forests, um, Tronce, which is really tightly knit, not as expressive, but it gives you a lot of texture. This is also a barrel that needs to age longer. So you're not going to get the benefit of a Tronce barrel if you're only going to age for six or seven or eight months. You need to have the wine in there for 16 months plus. Otherwise, you're not going to get the benefit from it. And that is where, which we use for the book 17, for instance, and the, the black line. Um, then we use Nevers and Allier. So those are two wines that we've, uh, um, areas in France that we think works really well with our barrels. Um, the grain of the barrels, the expression of it. Then you go to the next layer and you look at the, the way that the cooper is going to treat the barrel. So what they do after they fell the trees, they cut it into to staves, essentially. Um, not like the stave you see on a wine barrel, but more the type you see in Baldus Wera. So it's just four by twos almost, I want to say. Um, so they will let that stave sit in the, the sun and the rain for most of the time, two years, but they will go up to as much as three, four, five years. The longer it stays in the rain, the more water will come into contact with. Of course, it's France, so you get a lot more rain. That's going to drain some of the tannins. And also very importantly, um, again, a, a science on its own is the fungi that will start growing on the staves. All of that will have an impact on the tannic and flavor profile of the stave in essence. Then you go to the next stave and they actually start charring the barrel on the inside. So um, with whiskey oak barrels, they, they char it. So they make a really hot fire. You get a lot of that caramelization. You get a lot of the caramel flavors coming through lot of sweetness with um, wine barrels they will just toast it lightly um, and this is very important so at certain temperatures certain aromas will develop so let's say you take a very slow um, soft fire which will not give you a lot of heat then you will get certain aromas that develops and it will happen over a certain period of time if you take a very hot quick fire again you will get a lot of that chocolate notes um, a lot of the like burnt toast and that's how they were used to make um, those coffee pinotages it would go into those barrels that would really toast it hard and fast and it was purely a winemaking manipulation to get a style um, so for us you want to almost re think about it as if you've got a big powerful cabinet like let's talk napa and you're going to put it into a third full barrel where you've got no oak influence. Um, and it's just basically the positive influences of osmosis happening. You're not going to make the wine any better than what it already is. 
Um, you're going to have a nice style maybe where it's, it's a bit more, let's call it wine driven, but you're not going to get the best that that wine can possibly be. But by putting it into a tranche barrel, aging it for 20 months, adding that layer of oak to almost throw in the fruit um, nuances and get that extra little bit of texture going, that's where you make the best possible wine from it within a style, of course. Um, vice versa. Now, let's say you go to Elgin and you've got a beautiful um, Pinot Noir and you can go and take this really aggressive barrel and you pair it up with that. You're completely going to over oak the wine. You're going to completely take that nice red fruit nuances away and you're going to spoil the wine. And that's where um, barrel choices actually comes back to what style you envision, what types of grapes you get, and how you're going to frame that grapes and the wine to make it as pretty as possible um, through battle choices. So it's, it's something that's it's very simplistic, but it's actually very complex to find that sweet spot. And it's, it's something that you actually have to experiment with over time. Um, like I said, I was in America and, and I had this one barrel that was just hitting the spot every single time. And I remember back then I was, uh, my airline was back here at that stage. So um, uh, I remember I was at a place with a, a lady called Martha McLennan. I think uh, her husband is a winemaker or the wine director for Holland. And we were in a big cave and I was like kind of trying to make little notes as I was going through with others seeing me. And after a while, she told me like, listen, your boy, put down your pencil. Um, I can give you an Excel sheet with everything that I do because it's not necessarily going to work for you. And, and I came back and I'm like, yeah, sure. I'm just going to steal everything you're doing. And I came back and I ordered that exact same barrels. Didn't work at all at Turin. Um, so it's all about finding that synergy um, in essence. Is there any questions? Does that answer your question, Silas? Or um, is there anything specific that I can maybe be a little bit more on point with? You couldn't have answered it any better. You're just so detailed and I love it. Thank you so much. Okay, cool. Tohani, uh, you must show me like this if I start raveling. Uh, I can sometimes <laughs> can drag it on. It's great. I'm learning out over here. I love all the details. I mean, there's just things that I didn't even really realize. I knew that barrel selection was important, but the way that you described it, um, one of the things that you said, it's like barrel kind of like frame the wine. So like you make this great wine, but then like you can have an amazing painting, but if you put it in a crappy like frame. Exactly. I think that's so. Yeah, art can add to it. So I love the way that you, you're explaining everything. Does anybody else have any questions? Chelsea, so I've got two more questions from Silas that I still what? have to answer, but... Oh, yes. Yeah. I must yeah. say, if you, if, you quit, if you quit winemaking, consider going for lectures. You're just so good at what you do. <laughs> I don't have to work on my English, but uh, we'll, we'll try and get there. <laughs> it's perfect. Okay, so I will just finish. Sorry, Tendo, yes. you've got a question. Silas, I'll get to your natural fermentation yes. questions now, but I see Tendo also have got a question. Yes, I, 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 I must not take all the time. <laughs> take your time so we can balance also. Yeah. Yes, that's my my question is just very small questions. Yeah, your wines are very very good. I've got all the ranges for, from Black Lion up to the, the bottom one. But I've got a small question on um, the Torren Z and the Torren um, uh, the Fusion Five. Is there any major difference besides that the Fusion 5 is a cap driven and the uh, Z is a mellow driven? Because I found it some more difficult to, because I like to put it on the same level, but to the guest experience, they found it maybe they like more uh, Fusion 5 than uh, uh, Z. But for me, I like to put it on the same level because I know you owe attention to this or to all your, you know, wines yeah okay i think that's a very good question and it's it's um maybe a nice break from the technical side of it all um so yeah. in essence um the the fusion and the z we envision to be the same quality um when i make the two wines um from the vineyard upwards we think the same quality and, and what is the difference is the terroir first of all so you're talking waste facing which is extremely warm uh, again, I say extremely warm within our area. So we are in a cooler area, um, but the west facing side, you're going to get much more exposure and 
that is actually why the Fusion 5 is, is Cabernet Lead, Cabernet Malbec Lead, is because those two varieties does like the sun a little bit more. They do like that little bit of extra heat. So that's why we made that blend from the west facing side. So the deterrent Z comes from the south facing side. So a little bit cooler. We've got the road directions, northeast, southwest. So the ocean breeze that comes up from around about 10.30 comes through the vineyards, cold, cools everything down. So that's the two driving forces behind the styles. It's actually just the, the terroir and which varieties will best describe that terroir. So you do get massive differences in the two styles. So the, the fusion is a little bit smoother, a little bit bigger, a little bit, um, it's just a little bit more of that expressive style, if, if you want, packaged very elegantly. And I think that is why it does find a lot of traction with a lot of people. So it's one of those wines that if, if you want to impress somebody and you, you've got to take that one bottle off the shelf, it's a very safe one to take because I think a lot of people will be drawn to the quality and the textures and the expressiveness of it. The Z, for me, the same quality. Um, I actually some vintages prefer the Z to the Fusion. It's, it's, of course, Merlot and Cabernet Franc lead. Um, and I think the style in which it's made reflects the Pomerol area perfectly. So the, the wine, because it's Merlot and Cabernet Franc lead, is a little bit more linear. It does give you that really nice acidity coming through. So on its own, it's not necessarily always as inviting as the Fusion 5. You get this days when you open it up and it's just the most spectacular wine you'll have that day. Um, where it comes to its own is if you start pairing it up with food. And, and I find that's the same with, with younger Bordeaux. The moment you start going to French style cuisine, so you start talking duck confit, um, food that are really rich, that's where the Tour and Z really comes to its own because it just brings everything together, cleans it up nicely. Um, so for us from a production level, we're trying to reflect those two different areas on our farm through the different two blends. And then for two separate, um, almost culinary experiences. So fusion, you're a bit more on the elegant side. So maybe uh, a nice loin. Um, see much more with your, with your fatty, richer, like a almost earthier umami notes. Works a little bit better with Z, I'd say, actually. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that's great. Myself also, I like the, the Z, uh, the, but I like, from, you know, when you're recommending the wines to the guests, you like to uh, express your experience about the wines. But sometimes I found it very difficult to bring them no, from Fusion, Fusion 5 to, to Z. But now I think I'll keep on convincing them. Because, look, I think if, you, if you're human, you always look at price. Um, yeah. So I think a lot of the time the perception is out there that the, the Fusion 5 is a superior blend purely because it's, it's, it's more expensive. And I, I know myself as well, you, when you go to a restaurant, you've got more or less a price limit out there. So you kind of sometimes skip the bottom wines, yeah. which sometimes are absolute gems, and you skip the, the really expensive ones because that's not in your budget. And you start and try and figure out in that top end budget, you want to spoil yourself tonight. So you allocate X amount of, of rands or dollars and try and search for it then. And then you see same producer, two wines, two different prices. And I mean, it's human nature. You're going to think more expensive one better, um, slightly cheaper one, maybe a little bit not as good as the other one. And there's a very specific reason for us into why you've got that price difference. So back when we started the two brands, the, the Fusion 5, I think that was the huge hit in South Africa. It was the first winery or first wine to be on first vintage scored higher than 90 points um, with wine advocate. Um, new kid on the block, it was a really, it was a new concept, the five variety Bordeaux concept. So there was a lot of things going for it and it got a lot of really good traction right in the beginning. Um, then after that, we started developing the south facing vineyards and we, we said, let's be true to this vineyard because it's not going to express itself the same way that the west facing vineyard will. And we developed the Z concept. And because it was younger vines than the fusion at that stage, we said, let's bring this in as almost like a gateway drug, if you want to call it that. So 
let this be the dacha to the cocaine almost. So, so, so uh, that's a horrible metaphor. <laughs> um, but, but what we said was, let's, let this wine bring you into the brand. So at that stage, because the vines were a little bit younger, Merlot dominant, it was the easier drinking wine. Then as the wines matured, we found that the quality is the same. Style is, of course, different. But now you sit in a scenario where, where although we think the quality is the same, you can't go to the consumer and say, okay, this wine, we're going to bump with 35% the price. I mean, nobody's going to accept it. If I was in the same situation, I wouldn't accept it myself. And that's why the Z, unfortunately, on a price level for us, uh, for, for you guys, it's maybe a little bit better, um, yep. is lacking behind the fusion. It's purely because of a marketing decision we made by, way back then. Okay. Um, it is slowly coming up, but you've got to change perception now. So it, it's something that works very slowly. And that's why we also need your guys' help in, in just explaining it and breaking that perception a little bit. It, it's a, it's a long-term project to really get that um, through to the end client. Okay. Yeah. Does that answer thank it for you? you um, yes. You know? Thank you for the wonderful answer. Okay, cool. Okay. So we go back to Silas, topic of natural fermentation. <laughs> okay. So yeah, you've got hundreds of perceptions and I'm going to give you my, my take on it. Um, you're going to tell, talk to the next winemaker and he's going to tell you I'm talking a load of rubbish, but, but here's my take on it. So in the, the, the vineyards, you've got a lot of yeast. Um, you've not got a, a lot of um, what's called uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which is the one that can actually ferment alcohol to a high degree. So what natural yeast does, is, or what, let's maybe first take the topic of selected yeast. So a selected yeast, once upon a time, was a natural yeast. And this was something that dominated the fermentation and they said, wow, Whatever's fermenting here is amazing. So let's isolate it and then let's grow it in a lab laboratory. So every selected yeast once upon a time was a natural fermentation. They just took that one strain that was really amazing and they multiplied it and they, they give it to us in a commercial form. Why, when you go and look at selected yeast, most of them are selected from Bordeaux, Italy, winemaking countries that has been doing it similarly to us, but on a much bigger production scale for years and years. And that's because Saccharomyces cerevisia is a salad yeast. It doesn't lift as much outside in the vineyard. So they say for every thousand berries that you've got outside, you might find one yeast cell of cerevisia, the correct one to ferment the uh, alcoholic fermentation. So it's not something that lives outside, it lives in the cellar and it actually overwinters in the cellar. And next year when you bring grapes in, it will actually start populating again. So a lot of that successful isolates comes from 300 years of fermenting grapes and that one yeast cell or that one variance of a yeast that's been successful has just come out to the top over 300 years of doing it. Um, when you ferment with a selected yeast, uh, there's a lot of great things about it. And there's one or thing, two things that can make it a little bit um, linear, if you want to call it that. So the great thing about it, it, it takes over the population of the wine very quickly. And you know with what, you know what to expect from it. So if you've got a very specific batch of Cabernet and you want to drive it into a very specific direction, you can do that with the selected yeast. Um, also with the selected yeast, you get hundreds of them. So you can really be versatile in which ones you want to choose. You can even mix one or two or three of them together in your own little concoction and use that on a fermentation. What a natural fermentation does is it's very low in Saccharomyces cerevisiae. It's got a huge amount of complexity of good and bad that you've always got to realize. So you cannot do a natural fermentation if the quality of your grapes is not great. If you stop working with average quality grapes, um, the population of negative stuff in there is too much and you will actually just end up making vinegar. So if you've got really good grapes, you ferment it naturally, you allow the positive stuff to work a little bit more in symbiotic 
relationship with these others. So as opposed where you've got one strain in a natural fermentation, just hitting it and running with it, here for the first two, three, four percent of alcohol, you've got a lot of diversity all interacting with each other. And then eventually one of them will take over, dominate the other ones. Some of them will die as soon as the alcohol starts going over 2%. Most natural yeast actually die by the time you reach 5% alcohol. They can't live after that. And then you will take something that will um, take over the population. Now there's a few things to consider with a natural fermentation and that is your potential alcohol. If you've got a big potential alcohol, so let's say you bring your berries in at 25.5, 26 piling. You strongly have to consider whether a natural ferment will actually finish that fermentation for you. So your risk for a stuck fermentation becomes quite big. Um, you've got to look at, like I said, the quality of the grapes. That's, that's very important. You do not do a natural fermentation if you don't have pristine grapes. And then what a fermentation, a natural fermentation will do is it will just be a little bit more broad, it will broaden the texture component of it, but your berries won't be necessarily as fruity or your wine as fruity as with the selected yeast. So it's, it's much more of a sensory exploration of the textures of a wine than necessarily the aromatic potential of a wine. So that's the positives of a natural fermentation. Um, I mentioned the negatives, the same way a selected yeast, it's got a lot of positives, but it does express one gene, or not necessarily one gene, but one um, variance of a yeast genes. So you get a little bit more linearity in that one, which can be positive if you're gonna blend, but it can be negative if you only wanna have one or make one one from it. So there's no, right or wrong answer is you'll get a lot of winemakers that's very set on only doing natural fermentations and they've got the reasons. You've got winemakers that won't touch natural fermentations whatsoever. I think the answer lays between everything that I've just mentioned. You've got to find that sweet spot that works for the style of wine that you want to produce and the end customer you want to speak with and, and all of that. Okay, that does that answer the, the question for you on that? Very well, very well, Mr. Charles. All right, and now we've got the last question that you mentioned, the, the maceration. And I think, again, again, you very very cleverly picked up on, on maceration. And I think you highlighted something very specific, is that you can over-extract. I mean, over-extraction is just as real as under-extraction. Um, the, the positive effects that you can get with a good extraction can, can get nullified with the over extraction. I think for me personally, I'd rather under extract something than over extract it. I think over extraction, it becomes horribly one dimensional with under extraction. I think you sometimes get a little bit more complexity. Um, over extraction is one dimensional. It's in your face. It's all over the top. I, I absolutely hate it. For that reason, you've got to be very clever in how you go about it. So let's take making wine in a, in, a, in a tank versus making wine in a barrel. So with, with book 17, we actually ferment it in a barrel and we only roll it. But let's say you take a barrel, you put it upright and you take the lid off. If you make wine in a barrel and you push it down the cap once, the force that you're exerting on that is much greater than when you're making it in a tank. So when, you, when you're making wine in a barrel, you're only going to do cap management once, maybe twice a day. When in a tank, you might do it up to as much as four times a day. If you're going to do it more than twice on a barrel, just because of the volume and the ratios, by the time that you get to the end of fermentation, your berries will actually be disintegrating and you will be sitting with a lot of pulp. So when you actually press it, it blocks up the press completely. It's just like a mush that you make. If you do that, that same action on the tank, you're actually going to be under extracting. So it's very important to know what you want to get from the grapes that you, and how you're going to extract it. 
And then your, your method must also pair up with whether you want to have a post-fermentation maceration at the end or not. So let's say two scenarios um, which were re very real in 2020. So 2020, the crop was a lot bigger and a lot more compressed. So we knew that we had to rotate tanks. So for Merlot, which comes in first, we had to do a lot of cap management. So we did four, sometimes as much as five cap management actions. So punch downs a day um, for the whole duration. So normally I only do, to give you a context on that, normally I only do about two or three cap managements in a day, but you only, well, you, we knew we we're only gonna have 10 days of managing the cap in total. Um, when I talk about putting the, the wine cap management for, for 45 days, I know already that I'm gonna do that. So I work very soft in the beginning to make sure that when you get to the end, you're not over extracting. So it's, it's something that you already, when you start the fermentation and your extraction period, you know that you're gonna work soft here so that you can extend the maceration to end up all the way over here. Um, but it's a, I think that is a very crucial thing about winemaking is, is how you're gonna do that maceration. And it's a very valid point that if you don't do it correctly, you over extract and I think you, you can ruin something very special, very easy. I think we have one more from Don. So Don said, what is wine doing in bourbon, rum, or whiskey barrels? Is it just, mar is it just a marketing gimmick or is it a way to cut costs? Um, it's, a, it's a cost cutting factor. Um, maybe that's a, I don't know of too many people that makes their wine in, in rum barrels and whiskey barrels. The, the thing with those, this oak, it's, it's much more coarser grained oak. So um, it's, it's something that's made to give you a lot of that caramel flavors and, and, and all of that. So it's, that is for a wine that's easy drinking, enjoyable. You add this almost a synthetic flavor component to, to it by adding it to those type of barrels. Um, it can be used as for, of course, as a blending component. So if you've got a wine and you put one barrel into this highly toasted um, barrel, you will get this chocolate component, which you can blend in. I mean, we all do it and, and you'll always find that one barrel that will give you chocolate because then you can blend it in if that is what you want in your final wine. But if you're going to use it on a commercial scale, I think that's going to be on the, the spectrum where you make wines, which you almost add a flavor in to it. Um, typically, like I mentioned, the, the coffee pinotages that we had back in the in the, the late middle late nineties, uh, or not nineties, in uh, talking two thousand eight two thousand nine, I think coffee pinotage became famous, and that's something that you can make from any any wine by just adding a very specific type of barrel or even oak chips to it. So you can actually take wine, and I think the the guys were hugely successful in, in, in taking a marketing opportunity and actually taking wine to, to consumers that didn't like wines. For us, wine is sometimes very intimidating, but the moment that you can smell something in the wine and you can familiarize yourself with it and you can describe it, you become much more familiar with wine. So I think that's what the guys that made these coffee mocha pinotages did hugely clever. They took wine and they took it to a consumer, which didn't necessarily drink a lot of wine, but all of a sudden you taste wine and you can tell somebody, wow, this tastes like coffee or it tastes like, like a mochaccino or whatever. Um, so you made it familiar to them and it was also easy drinking. So it, it did that. And, and that's what those battles does. It adds a flavor and to wine. Um, and I think that's why it, it went through this huge boom because you got this whole brand of new consumers that didn't necessarily drink wine come into the wine market. And it's a taste that I think over a period of time, it kind of dissipates on you and it becomes a little bit over the top as you start understanding the finer things of wine. But I think, uh, yeah, a uh, long rambling on, but that's what I think those battles does. I agree. I think it's for like novice wine drinkers who just want to enter the market. Go ahead, Carol. 
Oh, wait a second. Uh, okay, there we go. Thank there you. you go. Uh, sorry, just to go back to your cap management in stainless steel tank versus barrel, does that have to do with temperature control? Because obviously it's a lot easier to control the temperature in a stainless steel tank than it is in a wooden barrel in the middle of the cellar. Not. Um, okay, yeah. so, so that also comes into the equation as well. So um, two things. So if you've got a barrel, and specifically the way that we ferment the book 17 in the black line, it's, it's literally inside a barrel that we put horizontally, and we put it on little rollers, and then we just roll the barrel. So there we don't have mechanical action. So your berries will stay after the moment that Duani um, pressed it for us with the feet. From there, we don't touch the berries again. So that's also why you can extend the maceration period for up to a, of, of 60 days, because you don't have a mechanical action. So over that time, the berries, the, the wine will actually start fermenting inside the berry. Mm -hmm. And over time, it will migrate out and become the cap that you would see in a tank. To increase the temperature, so the book seven in the black line, and for any, any barrel fermentation, you actually have to increase the ambient temperature to get the temperature correct of the fermentation. So let's say you want to be at, you're going to get about 23, 24 degrees naturally, if you just ferment in your natural ambient in summertime inside the cellar. That's the kind of peak you can expect from a, a barrel fermentation. So we actually have to lift the ambient to get to about 26, 27, sometimes 28 if you want to extract it a little bit extra. Whereas with the tank, the bigger the volume, the more you've actually got to cool it down. Um, and that's the nice thing about the tour and the tanks that we've got. Um, we ferment between three and six tons of grapes in them. The, the top of the tank is, like I said, just as wide as the tank is high. So you also dissipate a lot of the heat that's built up with, with fermentation. So what we typically find is you'll get a nice slow start of your fermentation. Um, if you leave it unchecked, it will go up to as high as 33 degrees, which you don't want. I think that's a horrible temperature to be at for, temp uh, for fermentation. So if you leave it unchecked, it will go there. If we find that the temperature go up to about 27 degrees, we'll turn on our cooling water, which will circulate in a sleeve around the tank. We'll probably turn it on for about two hours. It will turn the temperature down from 27 to about 25 degrees. At this stage, you're talking 10 boiling. That will just break the, the camel's back. From there, it will slowly come up back to about 26, 26 and a half degrees, and then it will start going down naturally again as fermentation slows down. So, I think it goes again into maybe it was one of those side things from the planning that was done in the beginning. Maybe it was just pure luck. But the way that it works for us is that you get this really nice slow accumulation. You break its back at the peak of fermentation for two hours with cold water. And then it will just plateau out at 26, 27, 28 degrees, wherever you want it to be. And then it will start coming down. Okay, thank you. So guys, we have about 10 more minutes exactly left. Does anybody have any more questions? Yes, I've got, I've got one more question, John. Okay, go ahead. Do you unmute me? No, no we can okay, hear you. Yeah. Okay, okay. Hear you. okay. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> just my last question, Charles, is uh, we normally know when there is exchanging of the ownership, sometimes things they might go um, other side. But we are glad that because you see are still there, the, you have been there for, I think, for more than 10 years. Is there any other new things we can expect? Maybe, or maybe a testing room, or you're gonna just keep yourself uh, you're going to just keep tutoring as it is going forward with the new owners? Yeah, I think a uh, very valid question. I think uh, very relevant to the, to the industry. So um, maybe just the history of it all. So it, it was the, 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 the winery was founded by a gentleman called Emil Den Dalk. Um, sure most of you guys know him. Um, he and Albi Koch um, started together. So Albi... Um, has shares in the business 
um, when when Emil still owned it. And Albi was the first winemaker, so he made the first um, 10 vintages of, of uh, Couturin. I was appointed as his assistant winemaker back in 2008. Um, so, Two years ago, uh, yeah, two years ago, 2018, Emil actually sold the property and it, it went through a very big vending process. So we had huge offers for the for the wine. I think we're very fortunate that we've got a quite a strong brand. Um, and what he was looking for is uh, somebody that will take on what he started. Um, we didn't necessarily want to sell it at the highest price. We just be chopped up and, and made something that doesn't fit with what we've been building up for 20 years. Um, I myself, I've been involved for 11 years. So although it's not a family owned business, I think everybody here is like family. It's, it's it truly is that type of, of environment. And this is where, where Daniel came into the picture. So Daniel that you met a little bit earlier, his history is he was an investment banker and um, he's got a partner in Switzerland that told him like, listen, yeah, I've heard about this farm through the, through the grapevine that's up for sale. And, and Daniel told him point blank, you don't invest in a winery, not at all. Like wineries is a place where you go and lose your money. And the guy said, oh, well, that's a pity because it's, it's a place called the tour. And, and I actually quite fancy the wine. And Daniel said the moment that he heard the tour and he said, well, okay, now we can start talking. Um, let's go and hear this out because he's been, coincidentally, he's been following us for a long while. Um, his partner has been, his partner in, in business has been following us for a long while. And when they had the tour and they were interested and they said, okay, let's go and, and find out if we can do something here. And I think both parties resonated with, they want, we want to continue with what we have, but it's a little bit of new energy. And I think that's where the great part in the transition is. Um, the, the previous owner was at an age where I think you have to be a little bit more conscious of that you are maybe going to start retiring, handing over the baton. And I think also that you also become a little bit more safe in the way that you do things. You're not willing to take as many risks. You're not willing to invest as much. Of course, you, you, and I mean, I fully understand you're not going to invest if you're not going to make the, the investment back. And I think that's where the great thing is now with, with Daniel coming in as a big shareholder. Um, there's a majority shareholder in, in Switzerland as well, as well as Albi that still has got his shares. Um, is that we are reinvesting in our company. So what we're doing in the, the we just want to make everything, we don't want to change anything. We just want to take everything that level extra. So we are actually in the process of revenue. Re re ah, you've got to help me out with that word. Um, let's call it redoing. <laughs> um, I'm like uh, Cinderella. I've only got a certain amount of, of time that I can speak English and then it, my, my clothes called to rags. Um, so we are renovating the, the, the manor house. That's going to become our offices. We're going to open up slightly more to the public. So I think what makes a tour and experience special is that when you get here, you get to see myself, you get to see the winemaker, you see, get to see one of the owners, and you have an experience with them. And that will stay core to our experience here at the tour. But we do want to open it up and make it a little bit more accessible for, for every, every day. Um, visiting. So we, we've got this amazing view and, and a lot of the times we're hiding it a little bit. So we're just going to exploit the view a little bit. And, and we've got this terrace that we're building where you can have a coffee afterwards. And we're not going to open up a restaurant. I think you guys must have hair on your teeth to do what you do <laughs> on a daily basis. So we're not going to go down that rabbit hole. Um, but we're going to open it up and if you want to have a cheese platter or something, we're still going through what we really, we're really going to do that. But we're going to create that opportunity. So we just want to enhance the experience on the farm. Um, we are looking in the, the long run, maybe just freshening up a little bit of the image. Uh, but that comes always with the, with the change of ownership. I think that will always follow. But it is about 
creating and, and just actually sharing a little bit better of what we've got here because uh, we really do have something special and it's just about sharing that with, with the everyday guy out there. Nice. Oh, fantastic. That's great. So we hope to see all of you guys here soon. Um, yep. Tohani, you can't come for pleasure. You've got to come for work. Uh, so I'll see you in March. But the rest of you guys are always welcome to come and drink a other glass of wine or a cappuccino with me. I will work anytime with you guys. You guys are family, 100%. Just one quick question. Diversity. So is diversity a new line that we should look out for in restaurants and grocery stores? Or what is diversity? Because you said that you guys had a new okay. line. Yeah, so, Johanny, maybe to distinguish a little bit. So, you've got the, the Tour and Delicat, which I, again, is, uh, assume all of you guys know. So, that's our easier drinking everyday wine. Um, that's also more commercially available. So, that's something that we brought into the, to the line to say on our hot summer's day. That's almost our answer to, to white wine. So, it's, it's a wine made with 50% um, Malbec, which didn't get skin contact. So, it's almost like a white wine fraction, if you want. Um, blended back with older age Cabernet, Cabernet Franc and, and, and Merlot. We, we make the wine so that you can drink it slightly chilled. So it's actually, although it's in, in tasting profile, probably the easiest in terms of consumption. It's one of the more technical wines that we make to get everything right to work at temperature. So the first few years you would tell people, yes, a chilled red wine and they would, would almost kill you. You can imagine the, the traditional, the tour and clientele, they would not like put a, uh, take that cold wine and, and go shove it somewhere. But as soon as you, as you taste it, um, it it's hugely impressive. And it, the, the big thing that makes this wine tick is the way that it works with, with food. So cured meats, um, again, that fat, fattier spectrum of the, the food, food sphere works brilliant with that. That's our everyday drinker, if you want. And then you get to the diversity. So the diversity is out and out, our second label. Um, we call it the best of the rest, as I mentioned earlier. And that is a wine that after we've done all the blending, we look at the Cabernet that's left and the Merlot that's left. Because your Cap Franc, your Malbec, and your Petit Verdot actually determines the size of your fusion and the Z. Uh, we overplanted cab, uh, caps off and Merlot so that you can have a big selection when you're actually making your blends. So there will always be a little bit of both of these left. And then we go and see if we can make a, a blend that's going to be really pretty and that we can release into the market a little bit earlier. Um, and that will essentially be the diversity. So some vintages, it's as little as 4,000 bottles. Some vintages, it's it's maybe a little bit bigger. You're not going to find it in retail, unfortunately. 90% um, of the time it sells out uh, with one email. So that's a wine that sometimes it, it over delivers a lot on the price. So it's, it's one of those wines that we kind of give that back to our database. Um, and anybody, anybody can buy it, of course. But it's one of those things that we'll communicate more through the online spectrum and, and directly from the farm. It's not necessarily the volumes that you can go to a retail shop and, and list it there or even to, uh, to, to one of you guys and say, keep it on your list because um, the volumes is, isn't there. Okay. Makes sense. Wow, so that's it. And we hit two o'clock. Um, I want to let you go before you turn into a pumpkin. But this was so, like, this was amazing. I think we <laughs> all agree that this was, like, a lot, a lot of knowledge, yeah. a lot of insight yeah. into a wine that we already loved. And so now, I, I mean, I feel like I'm just in love with it even more. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, well, thank you. Like I said, I, I, I think especially in COVID times, it's, it's good to see new faces. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> um, so that's the first thing. And then, Thanks again. I think it was it was really nice, and it's it's actually nice to to hear like the kind of technical questions. Uh, sorry, I'm showing you where you sit on my screens now. Like she has a lot of technical questions. I think Carol attend a lot of questions come from the market, and, and it, it's usually for us it's really nice to 
to think about this stuff. Um, sometimes we also get caught up in the run of the mill, and it's actually nice to just sit and chat about all this stuff. And, um, and just, just know that um, I know we have some international callers on the phone. The torrent is available. I know it's available in the United States. I'm sure it's available in most European markets. Um, yeah, so if you have a chance, if you haven't tasted it, you should definitely taste it. And, you know, give me your feedback. Give Charles your feedback because it's a wine that I definitely love. Try the 2018 vintage because it's made by Twani as well. <laughs> wow, it's going to be amazing. <laughs> Yo, we, Wait, we, um, can't yeah, wait to taste that. <laughs> 2018 it's absolutely amazing. It's um, we had it the other day in when we did our blend tasting. So I always put like the the first one before we actually go into the set where we actually have to decide. I always put the the year earlier as a blind wine, just to get you into tasting red wines. Because otherwise, sometimes you discriminate the, between uh, you discriminate against the first two wines just because you're getting into the flight and. I can tell you that 2018 is absolutely amazing. It's it's really dense. It's it's like black fruit. It's it's a, it's a really a superb wine. So uh, you did something right. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Do you perhaps have an email address? Sorry. Oh yeah. Yes, Carol. I was just about to say you must either get it from Joanne or I can just give it to you now. It's it's Charles C H A. R L E S. Yes. Then it's at the Turin D E hyphen T O R E N dot com. Awesome. Thank you so much. I cannot believe how much information we've gained yeah. during the session. You've been so generous with your knowledge. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's Thank an absolute pleasure. And, and it's an open invite to you guys. Um, Whenever you feel like or you've got time free and, and you can join us here on the farm, please just give me a shout 24 hours in advance and we make make time for you. And uh, you've, you've always got an open invitation to us. Um, yeah, please, please do visit if you get the chance. I know you guys are also busy, but if you've got a bit of free time, you're more than welcome to, no, to come next week. definitely worth it. Yeah. Wonderful. Charles, I must say the way you, you took us through the whole session just is, is as inviting as it is and we can't wait to visit your place really. Uh, I don't know, I wonder how soon are you going to be open to the public as you say? Uh, yes, yeah, I think um, for us to give you a, a little bit of idea into what happened in COVID time. So um, we're in the agricultural sector and, and we were this a lot for that one or two days where we could actually not do anything so that those one days I myself worked illegally and the other police. So um, we, 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 in the beginning stages, I, I think this thing was really scary and we didn't know what was going to happen and how serious it was and all of that. So we took the, in line with government um, regulations, we, we asked all of our staff to, to go on, on in isolation. Um, we we're in a very fortunate situation where we could support everybody in that time. So nobody had to pay, take a, a pay cut. And luckily for us, nobody will have to take a pay cut. So I think that was one of the first things for us is to make sure that financially everybody is, is looked after. Yeah. And then followed like uh, some of the most exciting times in a while where we actually, two guys made the wine completely. So when you start going into the, the more, I um, almost want to say global part of it, the, the seller master part, if you want. Uh, sometimes you look a lot more into the vineyard and the picking times and you don't get to get your hands as red as they should be. Um, and it was lovely. I, I, I emptied each and every tank myself this year, pressed all of those wines. We did all the cab management. So I've gained all the weight back, but I lost a lot of weight during that time. So... So it was yeah. huge fun, actually. And then um, we've got a, a very small core team. So we've got six, six people in the vineyards. And we've got five, four people in the, the cellar. So for us, it's quite easy to, to isolate. And also, it's very family bound. So at the farm, we've got a family that actually just all stay together anyway. So for us, it's quite easy to self-isolate. So... So um, as soon as we were able to open up and, and we are able to, 
we, we've been able to open up for, for two weeks now for our um, staff. So we started working and we just follow very stra strong practices, um, isolating the vineyards itself. It, it's quite easy to do. You just work every second row. In the cellar, it's a little bit more difficult. So there we take a few extra precautions, but we've been very fortunate that we've been able to move the whole time. And, and I think for us, the most horrible part is, is the situation that you guys are in, in, in that you can't open up and, and you can't sell. And um, I think that's hopefully within the next week or, or two government changes that. Um, because I think you guys are probably, our thoughts go out to you guys that, that, that can't necessarily come out of isolation. I, I, yeah. I was lucky enough not to be in that, that situation at all throughout this whole pandemic. But I, I can see my wife, for instance, she, she's a lawyer and, and um, it's taking a huge toll on her not being able to, to do anything. And for you guys, it must be even worse. For her, the same. Because exactly, business yeah. essentially stopped completely. Yeah. It's getting tough. I'm not sure how much longer it can last, you know, because people are literally like starving. So hopefully the, the world or this country opens up so that people can get back to work a bit and just have more precautions, I hope. Yeah. Uh, I think that's, uh, we're getting a lot of data from a lot of different countries that's past the peak that got caught with the pants on their knees and some countries that were more prepared. So I think hopefully we can examine that really closely and, and open up because I think it's, it's tough out there. And, uh, I don't know, yeah. you, you don't want to lose lives, but our economy also, I don't know if it's necessarily going to be supporting a lockdown for much longer. Yeah, I don't want to lose lives either, but then sometimes people might I literally starve to death. So. Uh, I think that's the thing that I I think it's uh, you you must just see in terms of the the body count how much of that is of hunger. Um, so so hopefully we we can open up and, and not, like I said we've been in a very fortunate. Uh -oh. Hello. 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 <laughs> Wait a second. Yeah, he's frozen. So yeah, I think he might have turned into a pumpkin. Like I suspected he might after so long. Um, all right. Well, that. <laughs> yeah, we might just end the meeting. Oh, yeah, we'll probably just end the meeting. We had a really good time with him. Let's see. Yeah. I think he's gonna do back. Thanks everyone for staying there. Let's see. There. Uh oh. <laughs> okay. Hello. Two minutes. Okay. <laughs> All right, so if everybody just wave bye to Charles and then just say thank you very much. I told him that we're gonna end the call. Um, thanks so much, Charles, for coming. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Charles. Thanks, bye. everybody. Thanks, Charles. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thanks, thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Thank you, Tuani, for the great session. Thank you, everyone. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Thank you, Joanne.